Good evening, everyone. Thank you, guys, everyone that is a part of the Hope Squad. Uh, we really appreciate all of you uh, for joining us today. I have some amazing guests uh, that is with me that's going to share uh, this platform with me, and we're just glad that you're here and you're going to be a part. Um, I have two awesome, awesome business owners, uh, two awesome uh, CEOs in their own right, uh, and they are here to impart in you. Today, we're going to talk about how to discover your purpose. As you're joining us, do me a favor, share right now, go ahead and tag a friend, uh, invite your family uh, to join us. I know that we sent out to our entire team that uh, we decided to make this event free uh, because we wanted to be able to impart pour into people and empower people uh, for their destiny, for their next level. I see you guys that are watching on YouTube, those that are watching on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. I see Lafayette that joined us. I see San Diego just joined us. Uh, I see you guys. Thank you guys so much. All of Louisiana, I appreciate all of the city Hope for joining us. We really, really appreciate you guys. Let us start off by just simply praying. So Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you uh, for everyone that is joining us via social media platforms. God, we ask that an outpouring of your spirit still happens. We ask that whatever we say empowers people, equip them for their next level, that they can go through this journey, walking with you, God, and get direction from you. You said in your word that the steps of a good man are ordered by you. So as we hear this, God, we ask that you give us clear direction, order our steps, and clear our path, that every enemy be a lie, that in this next season of success, we can see complete victory. So we thank Thank you for it now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you guys for joining us. Look, let me bring these amazing two gentlemen uh, into this live. I got none other than at the top, Mr. Kevin Mullins. Uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself to you and kind of share who he is, uh, what he does, and we'll start there. So, Kevin, uh, let the people know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> man, I'm a friend of Pastor Showers, man. That's the best way to do it. Uh, you know, listen, uh, I always say it depends on what day you meet me, really. Um, I obviously am in ministry. I, I used to pastor. I pastored for 18 years. I no longer pastor, but I still carry on ministry for me more so in the marketplace than I do anything. Uh, so that's a, of most important value to me, man, winning souls. But the second thing that I'm powerfully uh, it created to do on life on earth is I know my assignment is, Pastor Showers, that is, to help people discover and to develop everything that God has deposited in their spirit. And that's becoming a kingdom influencer, creative, also kingdom ambassadors in the role of being an entrepreneur or marketplace missionary. And so I own a wellness company in the space of network marketing. I also uh, I sit on the board of a sports agency that deals with people that are in the NFL, NBA, uh, Major League Baseball, making sure that their finances are in order and also making sure that their life is being carried out in a way that represents the best of whatever brand they're trying to create. And uh, as you well know, I also uh, make movies. Um, I've had the privilege of executive producing two movies that were th theatrically released um, over the last uh, four years. We don't call what we do faith-based, we call what we do faith-driven. We have a huge desire to create the type of content that wouldn't just speak to church people, but would invite people that may never come to church into a theater or in these days into a home on whatever streaming device you watch stuff on and to be able to really t uh, tackle many of these tough subject matters that we're dealing with in our society today, but doing so through the lens of faith. And so I've written five books and, uh, you know, ultimately, once again, at the end of the day, man, sinner saved by grace and a guy that's just passionate about breaking the back of poverty off the lives of believers and helping them usher in their kingdom destiny. Oh man, Kevin, we so appreciate you for joining us, y'all. That's the one and only Kevin. <laughs> uh, y'all, man, Kevin travel these these states every day, all day, and pour into people and empower people. So uh, we're just really thankful to have him. Uh, but let's go uh, to the VP himself, uh, Mr. Marcellus. How are you, man? How is it in Houston right now, man? Oh, it's doing well. The uh, sun is still out here, so uh, no complaints. Nice warm weather. We survived the freeze that happened a couple of uh, weeks ago, and the things are the sun is out and shining. <laughs> well, Marcellus, do me a favor. Tell the people a little bit about yourself, man. Talk about Ohio State. Talk about playing basketball, man, and to where you are now. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's a tough uh, act to follow there. So I, I'm kind of envious I'm a second there. But uh, yeah, I'm a former basketball player, used to play basketball at the Ohio State University uh, for all of you in the Big Ten, you know, that we take a lot of pride in calling it the Ohio State University. So uh, play basketball there, club, got to work out with varsity, did semi-professional basketball, and then found my way into uh, personal finance. And originally, I thought I wanted to be the next Jerry Maguire and, and you know, helping athletes with the contracts and uh, helping them with those different negotiation means. And I soon realized I was more of a, a legal pathway. Uh, I was more of a numbers guy in the sense of doing the investments. And that's how I found my path into uh, what I do now in wealth management. So from Columbus, Ohio, recruited down here to Houston, Texas. I'm a senior vice president in Bank of America's private bank. I, I work with a lot of families and individuals, entrepreneurs in particular, who have uh, done well in their respective right. And I help them to preserve the assets that they've been able to accumulate over their lifetime. And more importantly, figure out a way to transition those assets to the next generation in a meaningful and impactful way. And so a lot of those different things will encompass philanthropy and encompass purpose and mission and creating a, a family enterprise, so to speak, and what I like to call a, a hundred year legacy plan. And so this is something that I've become very passionate about, have uh, even taken some additional studies and executive education to really uh, formalize my experience and knowledge in this space. And it's something that I absolutely love. And at the end of the day, it, as Kevin mentioned, I, I'm a teacher, man. I uh, teach people about subjects and uh, things that they may hear about or see in the news or may have some familiarity with, but want to understand how to specifically apply those ideas and concepts to themselves and their families and friends as well. Well, we so appreciate uh, having both of you guys uh, to empower us uh, as individuals, as business owners, as as business leaders, uh, and being faith based leaders uh, is sometimes so tough uh, in the industry that all of us navigate in. Uh, so, the first thing I want to kind of talk about, and I'm I'm really honing into Kevin here with this, is Kevin. Let's talk about discovering our purpose and knowing who we are and identifying ourselves in the marketplace and in ministry. And, you know, I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a subject matter that has to be, I mean, are we getting some feedback there, Pastor? Okay, yeah, good. You know, uh, I think we're good now. Um, I love this particular subject matter because anything that deals with identity, right, is obviously, I think the areas that most of us, uh, to some degree, often are misguided in, you know, often say from a spiritual standpoint, right, that kingdom identity is the prerequisite to kingdom authority. But even deeper than that, as Marcellus was talking about, you know, being a person that understands and teaches wealth management, if you have identity issues, you ultimately end up with inventory issues, which means if you don't know who you are in the framework of the kingdom of God, you could be a citizen of heaven, right? You could be a member of God's royal family, but live like an outsider. So on the idea of, of purpose, right? Discovering purpose, uh, whether it be ministry or also how to apply those things that you've learned or that you're passionate about in the framework of what one may call, you know, the marketplace. I think one of the first things we do, you know, as, as I go back and I read uh, early on, our first, one of our first kingdom mandates in Genesis, the ninth chapter. When you go read Genesis nine, especially the seventh verse, if, if you're taking notes or if you've got your Bible in front of you, um, I, I love many different translations, Pastor. But one of the translations that I really love on this particular subject matter is the message translation, a more contemporary translation. And here's why I love it, because so many times people say, you know, why am I here, man? What's my purpose? And I've got some questions that hopefully we'll get into that I believe can help you definitely hone in and discover some specifics of what you feel called to do. But on an overall more broad spectrum, from a standpoint of just, first of all, getting comfortable with the idea of some of the things that you're called to do, some of the things that you've been delegated to do. I love this. I'm going to read it for you. Genesis 9 and 7 in the message translation, it says it like this. And I want you to underline really the first two words. It says, you're here, which is a specific, uh, you know, command. And, and, and it's really an intimate relationship between the reader and our heavenly father. Here's what it says. You're here. In other words, people say, Kevin, what am I here to do? Like, what am I actually here for? Well, Genesis 9 says, you're here. Watch number one, to bear fruit. 
Now, the reason that's important, because even in the New Testament, the book of John 15, it says that when you bear much fruit, not a little bit of fruit, we know that everything in the kingdom of God must be multiplied. So God says in John 15, right, Jesus says, when you bear much fruit, you bring glory to the Father. So even if you're a part of this conversation, you're thinking, man, how could I really glorify God? How could I? You know how you can? Become productive, become successful, become wealthy, become a person that it, their life uh, creates an attraction to who you are, and that attraction ultimately leads to a conversion in the kingdom of God. So notice, number one, bear fruit. Number two, reproduce. Remember, what you cannot reproduce will die. What you cannot reproduce will die. Number two, you're here to reproduce. Number three, it says you're here. This is where Marcellus can help you. It says you're here to lavish life on earth. Now, Pastor Showers, I love that word because, but it ain't nothing. There ain't no poverty about that word lavish. Lavish is about as extreme and extravagant as it gets. So here, here it is. You're here to bear fruit, reproduce, lavish life on earth. And then the last one is live bountifully. So many times people are constantly saying, what in the world am I here to do, right? How do I discover purpose? And even in Matthew, the fifth chapter, once again, this is the message translation. But if you go write this down, Matthew 5 and 13, Pastor Showers, the very first sentence in Matthew 5, 13 in the message translation, Jesus says, let me tell you why you're here. What an incredible way to start a conversation. Let me tell you why you're here. And it goes on to say, to bring out the God colors of the world, which is light of the world, and to bring out the God flavors of the world, which is salt of the earth. So ultimately we can hone in and once again, help people really discover the individual purpose that they feel their uniqueness is in. But one of the first things we've got to do is discover, man, listen, you're here to what? Bear fruit, reproduce, lavish life on earth, live bountifully, be salt, be earth, which means I've got a great responsibility on earth to make sure that I take the gifts that God has deposited in my life and I acquire the skill set, belief system, and strategies that are necessary in order for me to represent the very best of heaven. Wow, Kevin, you you mentioned something, and I'm, I'm going to kind of dive into both of those uh, as we talk about discovering our purpose. Uh, and that I'm going to start with number one, bear fruit. John Maxwell said this. He says that any leader that has no one following them is only taking a good walk. And many times as leaders, we lack people following us. And really the people that follow us are the are our fruit bearers uh, because our team, the people that we pour into, the people that we empower to fulfill the missions are the people that assist us in bearing the fruit. There was something that happened in the Bible that when when uh, Moses sent in the spies and they came out, it says that they came out and they had to assist each other carrying the grapes because it was so plenty. And when you have people that are around you that you can empower to assist you, they reap the benefits as well as you. And that's a part of your reproduction and what's happened in your team. If you want to go to a multi-site corporation or you want to go to a multi-site church or any of those things, like you want to bear fruit and plant in different things, it's easier to reproduce when you actually develop people who think like you, who grow like you, who are equipped like you, and that you empower to fulfill those goals. So Kevin, you you tell me. I know that you're in a a multi level system um, that you have to teach people how to reproduce all the time. This the power of duplication. Uh, yeah. Let's 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 dive into that. How can we create a system as business owners that is easily duplicatable? <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> I mean, everything, you know, I, I, don't, I don't care what it is, right? I mean, even salvation, right? Is I mean, the message should be simple, right? Love God, love others, or, you know, give your heart to the Lord. That's simple, right? I think sometimes, man, and, and listen, you're in ministry, I'm in ministry, we're all in ministry, right? But I think sometimes preachers is what complicates it. I mean, we complicate this thing up. We try to make it, you know, more deep, more profound than what it really is. But ultimately, you know, people ask me all the time, they say, Kevin, you know, you, you, you've made millions a year in the industry as a distributor in 70 plus countries. Then you own the company. You own all these other companies. So how do I scale my business? And you know, what's crazy, Vontae. 
most people want to know some sort of strategy or system in order to really scale their business or reproduce, right? To be able to create something that can outlive you, which I love that 100 year philosophy that Marcellus was talking about, because so many times, right? When we think sometimes of, of, of our past, we often think in decades, right? Like I'll say, man, I'm from the 80s. So you'll oftentimes even distinguish yourself by the decade that you come from. But so many times in life, we only think in terms of today, right? That's scarcity mindset. We don't have today planned. You know, I always say, if you can't manage your calendar today, you surely can't manage a year, much less manage millions. You know, so that's that stewardship concept of understanding, man, that we've got to be prepared, right? Because the future is unkind to the unprepared. So on the area of reproduction, that's what real business is. You know, business and ministry, by the way, you mentioned being able to mentor others. That's what real mentorship is. That's a legacy also. It's something that outlives you. And so I, I want to just bring to the forefront that so many times people say, well, Kevin, how do I scale my business? How do we create duplication? And what's crazy is I think one of the areas people rarely ever talk about, especially in the, in the world of business. And I love talking about all the ins and outs of the numbers, too. But, but the thing to me that really allowed me to explode and to create duplication in every part of my journey as it relates to building teams of people globally is scaling kindness, scaling love, scaling passion. Uh, you know, scaling compassion. In other words, the things that seem intangible, but really are the makeup of what creates greatness, you know, because that even greatness, right? That's, it's hard to define, but at the end of the day, you know, a literary masterpiece is just written on ordinary paper, you know, a, a, a symphony, you know, that's an award-winning symphony is played on ordinary instruments. And so greatness, right, is not about what you have. Greatness is about what you do with what you have. And so ultimately for me, man, it's scaling ambition. It's scaling endurance and tenacity. It's the little things that just make you, you know, want to run through walls and confront every giant that's standing between you and your desired destiny. And I think when you can infuse other with that type of, you know, passion and enthusiasm to make a significant difference and to move people beyond just success into significance, that's the kind of stuff that creates explosion. And ultimately that becomes easy to duplicate. I think you're muted, brother. I'm sorry. Uh, when you have kind of an explosive system and you see that business grow, and I'm actually bringing Marcellus into this conversation right here with this, is that how do I manage phenomenal growth at once. How can I manage? So if I went from making a hundred thousand to making a million, how do I manage it? What, what do I do? How, what, what was the first thing that you would tell me as a business owner going from a hundred to a million? How, what would I do? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing you got to recognize is a uh, hundred to a million. That's a substantial jump and an accomplishment first and foremost. And what you have to realize is that those levels of capital and success, uh, there, there comes nuances and different problems that aren't the worst problems, that have, but there are different things that may not be there at lower dollar amounts. And so the first thing that I've always helped people think through is, you know, what is your intended impact that you want to have with your earnings, with the resources that are being blessed upon you? And so when I talk to them, I often break down investments in to three categories. And most people think of investments in the sense of stock markets. And that is one category for sure. That's the asset bucket that I would describe that in. The other two buckets are the ones that don't necessarily get a lot of attention, but it is there for a lot of people and how they think about their wealth. And that's uh, investments in the community and investments in the family. Uh, those last two, they're, they're, they're hard to quantify because investments in the family doesn't necessarily mean dollars into a 529 or you know, paying for college vacation. It could be investments into experiences, uh, family members, friends, relatives, where you want to expose them to different things so that, you know, the the things that you have access to that they may not, they get to have a little piece of it and get some experience and exposure from it. On a community aspect, uh, that's where philanthropy, um, being involved in the community, making sure you have an impact, especially within the churches, being able to give back and help others. It's one thing to make money. It's another thing to be able to take that money and leverage it and multiply it 
to be able to help the greater good and be able to help others. And so, as Kevin mentioned, as I mentioned again, Pastor Showers, we've had this conversation on legacy multiple times. You know, it's one of those things that you do want something that's going to live long beyond your time here on earth and be able to have an impact. You, you want people to still remember your name once you pass away and feel the impact, whether it was a smile, whether it was a charitable do gift or donation, whether it was just you having a conversation with them, helping them through a tough time or a rut. You want to have that type of impact on people. I feel in that vein and light that most people feel like there, there's a meaning to their interaction that they have with folks. Well, Marcellus, I'm so glad that you kind of went there. So let's let's talk a little bit about money. And I know most, um, you guys are multi seven figure earners. You know, I know that being around in this industry and even talking to you, Marcellus, uh, Marcellus will downplay it, but his role that he play, he really don't have conversation with guys that probably make less than 10 million a year for the for the most part. Um, so him sharing this wisdom on what can I do with my business to help improve and manage the increase that is happening in my business, the amount of favor, the amount of assets, the amount of resources that are being poured into my business. How can I manage it? And what can we do to better our economy for our business and for us, even if it's our ministry, how does that look? Let's talk about discovering our money and managing it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so during that piece, that's where uh, as you have that money and you want to manage it, a lot of folks will want to reinvest back into the business. And that allows for continued growth and it allows for continued impact. And so what you want to do is you, you don't want to take money out and, and siphon out so much that the business stays stagnant. But you do want to reinvest those proceeds back into the business, continue hiring folks, continue to expand till you get to an optimal level. Now, there is a level where you can go above the, the required amount that would be optimal. And at that point, then it becomes more of an expense than an investment. And so you just want to be cognizant of that. And that's really getting into the balance sheet, looking at the income statement and understanding you know, the, the ebbs and flows of how to make money in your business or particular sector. The other piece that I would always uh, caution to business owners is to be aware of the trends, be aware of what's going on. I think uh, over this past year, a lot of us did not anticipate being in this pandemic where we would now be doing video calls, streaming, and, and is more widely accepted. This technology has been there for years. It, it, Teledoc, you know, video conferencing, Zoom, all of that. But there, there wasn't really that adoption for using the technology. And so when you think about being able to adapt and be fluid, understand that you'll have a plan more than likely in place of how you want to grow your business, how you want to achieve certain levels. But you do have to be fluid given the economy, given the environments. You never know what will be thrown your way. And you got to be able to adjust and pivot on a dime as well. Oh, so let's talk about that pivot. What would that pivot look like um, if if you were managing this in a, in a perfect world? What would that pivot look like? For me, that pivot would be an investment in technology. I, I love where technology is going right now. I think there's a lot of application for technology, not only with the video conferencing, but digital currency and being able to utilize different means of being able to pay for things. And, and so there's a lot of news, there's a lot of media around digital things. I'm, I'm sure you've even seen things on N NFTs, these non-fungible tokens and arts, and, and it's so much that's happening right now. A part of that is that the innovation and in technology has been brought forward at least five to 10 years. So something that would have taken 10 to 15 years for the rest of society to get comfortable with and adopt, we pulled that forward, you know, 3X in the sense of when people are getting adopted to it. We had grandparents doing Zoom. You had grandparents doing video conference calls where before, you know, it was hard to even get them to understand how to do the iPhone. And, and now, you know, my, my grandma calls me on Facebook portal while I'm uh, at home and wants to see things in this uh, completely new world. So is one of those things where technology will definitely be the, the new way. And I, I think for a lot of individuals, especially those who have seen technology progress, a lot of us can attest to, you know, having a brick cell phone to now we basically have a computer in our hand. 
And that's only going to continue to improve uh, with 5G, with fiber optics. And it brings up a lot of things that from, from an infrastructure standpoint, there's going to be a lot of investment in that piece, not only here in, the, in this country, but globally. And I, I think that that impact would be, it's going to be amazing. I know that um, I had a chance um, and uh, Marcellus and I actually both were supposed to be in San Diego this past weekend uh, with an investment into private aviation. Um, and coming to the table with something like that, it can be very much a big investment uh, but it can be a very lucrative investment. So for guys that are watching, and I, I know that I see all of your questions on YouTube, I, I promise uh, that we will get to them as soon as I can. Uh, but um, stuff like private aviation right now could be a major move for so many people because this is going to turn into uh, from a $50 million probably into the next three years to probably close to a billion dollar industry. Uh, and it's going to move fast. Uh, so those are things that I think that we can use, but also I think that we can use them to empower the kingdom of God. I believe that your resources that are given to you are given to you to empower the kingdom, empower your community so that you can build it, grow it, expand it. Uh, but it's also so that you can live a sustainable life so that your family can have pleasure and enjoy life and take a vacation and take a break. Um, so this is something that I want to ask Kevin here. Kevin, when I'm discovering my purpose and we're on this journey, we're building a business, how do I know when it's time to get rest? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a crazy question, especially for uh, someone like me, man, because, man, I, I, I go. Uh, but but it's, it's obviously, uh, uh, you know, and it has to be, you have to be intentional, right? I just say that, you know, anybody in life, if it's a priority to you, right, you just have to put it on the calendar. And yet at the end of the day, I think we all understand areas of our life uh, when we're not rested. I think you just kind of know, right? I mean, you're, you're either not making the most clearest decisions. Um, that's where you also need an incredible group of people that surround you because if they flow with you and understand the rhythm in which you walk and make decisions in, they'll be able to know when you're not at the top of your game. You know, so one of the things I always tell, especially, you know, uh, you know, young entrepreneurs or people just starting, right? The person that, you know, makes uh, very little money and they're trying to get, say, to just six figures, much less, you know, the idea that seven figures is even possible. Most people are already working hard, right? They're just working hard at the wrong stuff and they're probably hustling now. They're just hustling in the areas that are not productive. And so one of the things I, I, I talk to people about is just understanding that there is a season where I think you have to be temporary unbalanced, you know, whether it's a person that's, you know, going in the military that has to go off to boot camp and possibly even go off to war. You know, no one ever uh, second guesses someone that has to be away from their family for three or four months, you know, if they're off serving their country. And, and the same can be said, of course, with business. There are times where in order to get your business soaring, right, in order to really get it to an area where you feel like you have momentum, um, where, where you, you're in a positive state, uh, you know, of, of, of maximum growth, uh, that'll require sacrifice. And, and by the way, faith in itself is risk. You can't even read the Bible and read about faith and not understand there's risk. And I ain't talking about swimming with sharks, you know, or jumping out an airplane without a parachute, but I'm talking faith is risky. I mean, when you look at Peter, Peter left his entire livelihood on the banks of Jordan just to follow God. <laughs> that was a risky thing to do. He was a wealthy man. He this this These wasn't weekend bass fishermen over in Houston, Texas. I mean, these guys own boats. Their entire life was wrapped around creating streams of revenue. So, you know, for them to leave all of that, you know, in place and to follow a man, then the risk was they had to they had to at least be able to foresee that there was a potential for a greater reward on the other side of something that they were unfamiliar with. And so I just want yeah. people to understand you got to get temporary unbalanced to get anything going. But then there comes an area or once again, I think if it's a priority, it has to be on the calendar. And for people that are highly driven, people that are tenacious, you know, ambitious and always seem to live in the extra mile, there's nothing worse than, than getting to a state where your brain and your body can't function at the highest capacity. And so I think when, when, you, when you're built like that, you have to have people around you that can call you back into a state of understanding you need some rest. And then I think the other thing is, once again, you just have to put it on the calendar. 
it's important to put it on the calendar and rest should just be one of those things. And by the way, rest is different for everybody. And, and when I use the word rest, Pastor Showers, I don't mean sleeping. I mean, even, even perfect rest in the Bible is not sleeping. I think you can be busy and still be restful. So I just, you know, it's a twofold, it's a two-sided coin. But at the end of the day, I think we live in an entire world where people oftentimes are more lazy than they are completely laser focused and driven. You know, so the conversation comes up about rest, but it's rare that I meet someone that's truly on their game, man. You know, I love that. I love that video with Bishop Jakes. You know, he's talking there about, uh, you know, about hustling and grinding. He said, you know, most people today that think they're on their grind, he said, they ain't doing nothing. They're on the couch watching Netflix. You know, and so I love Bishop T.D. Jakes' thought on that because I think the idea of hustling, right, is, uh, is, is being busy and not necessarily productive. But rest is absolutely valuable because any time in my life I made decisions that wasn't good for me and my family, it's when I was completely exhausted, but I didn't know I was. So I'm, I'm going to take this question just because uh, it's got like a hundred and something people that are watching on YouTube versus uh, kind of a lot less on Facebook and stuff like that. But I want to take this question from YouTube and I actually want to direct this to Marcellus just because it's a money question. So they said, how do I know in my business when my business have reached a turning curve financially? Hmm. Well, there's, what, there's, I guess they're asking really, what is the dollar amount in business that you feel like is the turning curve for their business? And I think that kind of varies, but you. Yeah, that, that's exactly it, it. It does vary because it, there's different levels of business. The, the dollar amount for a, a million dollar revenue producing business is going to be different than a dollar amount for a $50 million revenue producing business. So if you look at it in the sense of percentage wise and growth, it may be doubling of your business from the prior year to the current year, maybe that could be a good indication that you are now starting to have an uptick. If you think about the J, maybe you're starting to hit that little bit of a J there. And so one of the things you'll want to do is look at your finances, look at what you forecasted out, maybe the next quarter, two, three quarters, and look at what you've uh, done comparatively over the past 12 months. And so that difference between the two, and you think about it from a percentage standpoint, I, I think once you start to get over 50, 75, you can see that there's been some growth from where things were previously. And you just want to make sure that you have the right infrastructure in place to be able to meet the demands of whatever your service or product that you're providing for your client or customer is. So, and I'm, I'm going to take this one. So Mary, Mary, uh, I don't know how to say her last name, but Mary asked this, this particular question. Uh, and I guess, Kevin, uh, how do, how, what is the best way? So what is the best way to equip the people that work for my company? What is the best way that you feel like you can equip people? Oh, for their, work? for their company? They're asking yeah. for themselves? I mean, you look, you have to invest in, you know, leadership training. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you, you can, you can, you can have the best products in the entire world. You can have the best systems in the entire world. Uh, but if there's no leadership to carry out the vision of the company, right? The CEO or the person that's the founder, that's what we buy into, right? We buy them before we do their vision. But ultimately there's something about their vision that encapsulates such a bigger picture that the buy-in demands me to be a part of it. it it inspires me to want to you know once again be a part of whatever that say vision or legacy is and i think ultimately you know you quoted john maxwell earlier i mean i don't think there's any better quote than at the end of the day man influence is nothing less nothing more than that's what leadership is it's nothing more nothing less than influence and so i think once again it's making sure that you bring people in from different walks of life that you invest it's kind of like the investing in self-development right you can always tell a difference with people that spend money on courses People that read books, you know, people that get out of their comfort zone and learn from people that don't look like them, don't vote like them, don't, you know, don't live where they live. You're just constantly stretching your capacity, right? And by the way, that's the same way it goes with even understanding the Bible, right? If all you have is the faith of, I mean, here I got a bottle, you know, water in a mason jar cup. You know, if that's all the faith you got, you could be standing before an open heaven, but that's all you'd get. That's it. I'd say, hey, Lord, fill it. Fill it, Lord. <laughs> But my capacity says that's all I have the capacity to receive where, you know, you, Pastor Advante, may be backing up there, you know, with fiberglass pools, dump trucks, freight liners, you know, because your faith, in other words, your revelation of what is capable is at, at a much higher level. And I think the only way to really stretch and hold people accountable to whatever it is that you're building as a company 
is to make sure you start. Look, if you don't have resources, you can start with stuff like John Gordon's The Power of Positive Team. I mean, little things like that. You can start with, you know, the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership and just teach that on a, you know, on a corporate level, like a mastermind group. But I think ultimately, if you're serious about upgrading your company, then at the end of the day, you need skilled people that can really, and think about that word real quick, like, you know, Solomon was teaching a wealth strategy in the book of Ecclesiastes. I think it's the greatest one, well, one of at least the greatest wealth strategies to ever be taught. And Solomon said, if the ax is dull and the blade is unsharpened, he said it requires more strength. But he said, skill brings success. Well, <laughs> I mean, he didn't say prayer brings success. And I'm for that, by the way. He didn't say fasting brings success. He said, skill brings success. And in another place, he said, those that are skilled will stand before kings. So, you know, Marcel's talked about playing basketball. You know, the people that end up making the most money at the next level, skilled individuals. So when I look at people like LeBron James and Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, you know what they have in common? Man, they're just there earlier and stay later than everybody else. They're just completely committed to develop. They become, in other words, in a world full of carpenters, they're committed to becoming craftsmen. So I would say to any business owner, you got to hone in on leadership material to make sure that you're able, that you got people in positions of influence that can not just carry out the vision component, but they can also mobilize people to carry out and materialize the vision of the company and also people that can model the behaviors that they're expecting from the people they lead. This is something that I, I share with my team and, uh, and I'll kind of, uh, come from what Kevin said. The thing about great vision is people don't give into a need, they give into vision. But great vision without great people makes great vision irrelevant. And if you don't focus on pouring into your team, developing your team, building them and equipping them, then the whole organization will fail because everything still rises and falls on leadership. And that leader will grow themselves, they'll groom themselves, they'll create balance, uh, and they will pour everything they have into those people so that they can grow together. Because the more information that the people on your team are equipped with, is the greater the capacity that that, that, that organization can go. And I kind of want to kind of dive into that, that if you with capacity, if you want to expand your capacity on what what you're doing, you got to want to expand your the way you think you got to expand your strategies and the concepts that you have applied. But also you just want you got to expand your knowledge and your know how for yourself as the leader or as the head of that organization. You have to read. You have to study organizations. You have to do unmet needs analysis on the things that are going on around you so that you can grow your business in that industry. So I, and I kind of uh, we got and we're just going to kind of have an open conversation here with Marcellus and Kevin uh, kind of on and we can go into capacity. But I kind of want to go back into discovering your purpose. And, and I am going to take I'm going to take about five of these questions. I have a guy that's kind of weeding through some of these questions that are irrelevant. But um, I kind of want to go into discovering your purpose and your purpose here. What do you feel like is the purpose now that we've had to evolve with all of this technology? Like, what is the what is the purpose for my money of why I got to evolve with technology? What's the purpose for myself on why I got to consistently in, evolve? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, and so when you think about the purpose, I, I oftentimes have clients and I, even myself, I, I go through a period of self-reflection where I want to understand my impact and, and why am I here? Why am I here? Uh, that's that's a question where a lot of people get to at some point is what am I doing this for? Why am I here? And and so when you think about purpose, I think that is the underlying fire that drives you. It, it gives you the motivation. It gives you the tenacity to go through tough periods of time. And it, it gets you to a point to where you can go out and accomplish a set out goal or uh, whatever it is that you may be in pursuit of. And the goal doesn't have to necessarily be monetary, but whatever it is that you're in pursuit of. And so when you have that purpose, I think it makes you a resilient individual. I think when you think about the investing piece that we talked about and having your purpose, what what is the purpose of investing? Why, why are you doing all this? Why do you want to accumulate all these funds and money? That's what you really got to have an understanding for, because if you do all of that and you don't spend a dime, you don't do anything and you pass away and it, it just goes to taxes or to wherever, 
then it, it, what for? What was the reason? What? Why did you do that? And so when you have an intention, an intentional and meaningful plan in place mentally, and keep in mind that stays fluid, that's where you can really execute on your purpose here and, and leave something behind that allows you to have a much greater impact than what you can do in your day-to-day life. Yes. So when when I think about my what is a what does a day to day life look like in in your world? What what is a day to day, a regular standard day to day in Marcellus world of banking? What does that look like? I know your office space is a lot different than most. So let's let's count. What does a day to day look like? Yeah, so day to day for me is going to be, you know, keeping up with current events, uh, what's going on in the markets, both domestically and internationally, what's happening abroad. Uh, generally, because your investment portfolio isn't just going to be in U.S. stocks, it'll, it'll likely have some exposure to international uh, stocks and businesses. And even the things that happen from a, a global economic standpoint, international uh, policies, uh, trade tariffs, uh, people closing or opening borders, things of that nature, those things affect what happens here as well. And so I I generally try to stay abreast of what has happened in Europe and Asia overnight uh, because they're a few hours ahead, a lot of hours ahead in some cases. And then from there, it's really reaching out, talking with clients and having more of a proactive discussion and conversation. One of the things that I pride myself on is really learning about our, my clients' uh, behavior. And, and so one of the things with investing is, is it's not just a, a simple, straightforward, you need to invest in this because there's a lot of different personality types and behavioral uh, instances that affect the way you invest. And so behavioral finance, the psychology of how you invest is something that's always been intriguing to me. So for my clients that, you know, I know they're reading the front page of the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, or they got CNBC on and it's talking about the hot topic of the moment, you know, how do I talk to them? How do I help them understand how that plays into the greater context of their portfolio? And where I get my most fulfillment and honestly where I feel the most accomplished throughout the day is when I had two to three meetings with families and we're talking about strategies that are that they are able to take and implement for their particular situation. And so by helping them understand a different perspective or helping them to explain a concept of something, a trust, a irrevocable trust, life insurance, things of that nature, and how it could be beneficial for them. Like I said in the beginning, at the end of the day, I'm a teacher, an educator, a problem solver, teacher, and educator. And so when I'm able to execute on those three things, that's where I feel like, you know, I, I've done what I needed to do today. I got you. So let's and Kevin, I, I guess I'll, I'll kind of bring you into this as we are uh, getting closer to uh, closing this session out. Um, Kevin, let's kind of talk about what does it take to run an organization like Navon? and to keep it functioning with so many different distributors and people that work and operating in other countries and across the U.S. Like, tell me, what does that look like? (laughs) You know, it it really isn't as complicated as it sounds. I mean, I think getting anything off the ground is where the complication is. You know, it starts with an idea. You know, that's really all an entrepreneur is. It's a person with an idea and wants to do something about it. And, um, and then, uh, you know, obviously finding you know, maybe the resources it takes to really launch that idea, at least in the beginning phases, uh, probably better said debt, you know, to some degree, and then finding a few people that you believe in, people that you can trust. And ultimately with that group of people, you commit, right, to building something that you believe, uh, like Marcellus was saying, that is bigger than just dollars. It's bigger than just having your name on, you know, a marquee. It's, it's something that is, 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 uh, feeling a void, you know, in the marketplace, something that can truly make a difference in the lives of people. So w- when your business gets up and running, I'll be truthful with you on my end, we've got skilled people, you know, that handle everything from customer service to being the CEO to right on down to just making sure that our manufacturing facilities are uh, keeping in par, you know, but, but, but at the same time, I think the thing that uh, the, the best business owners do is they, is they run towards fires, right? There's always a fire to put out if you're a business owner. 
there's always some level of chaos and crisis that you're being confronted with, whether it's the product not showing up on time, you know, no control over the United States post office, you know, when people can't get the product for 30 days and, you know, they want to blame you, you know, as a business owner, man, you, you can't even argue with these people there. So there's some level of, uh, you know, just grit. I think that you have to have to once again, be a problem solver. There's a, there's a reason why they say the wealthiest people in the world are problem solvers, right? Which by the way, also goes back to purpose. I mean, at the end of the day, everything uh, created by God has been created to solve a problem. Everything, uh, it, it, almost everything that exists solves a problem to some degree, right? And so your very existence says that God assigned you to a problem. And part of discovering purpose is discovering the thing on earth that you've been designed to, to, to solve. And so in the business side of things, you know, I, I wish I could make it more complicated at, at Vontae, but it's not for me. It becomes more simple when you got the right people in place. Yeah, there'll always be another headache. There'll always be another mountain to climb. There'll always be another loss. But ultimately, those are also in my mind, depending on what your perception of hardship and failure is, Failure to me is, you know, is, is, is not something to avoid. Failure is just discovery. It's just a new way to learn on what not to do. And if anything, it's in those moments of adversity that generally, uh, if you stay patient long enough and fight your way through it, you'll find yourself in the center of, of you know, whatever, uh, you know, ex explosive growth that you've been praying or envisioning for. And so um, I, I think once again, it's just making sure that for me, it's being able to put out the fires. It's being able to once again, uh, cast vision. I think all great leaders don't cast vision one time and expect the people to buy in. It's something that almost has to be reiterated. You know, I think it was Winston Churchill that said, if you got a good point, you know, he said, you drive it with a sledgehammer, which means, man, you've got to pile drive that thing on a consistent basis to keep people in, in, in alignment with what it is that you're currently doing. Yep. And so, you guys, I really appreciate both of you guys. I'm going to take uh, and allow each of them about two minutes, basically, to give a final statement to just whether you want to pray, whether you want to speak over the people, whatever that may be, because we're going to allow these people to connect to you. Uh, I'm going to take one question, and then I'm going to give them two, these guys two minutes, and I'm going to give some uh, kind of closing remarks uh, about what's going to happen Uh and we're going to bless some people today. So uh, this is what I'm going to start off with this final question. And it's from a guy named uh, Matthew Wiggins. Uh, and Matthew asked via uh, one of our social media platforms. He said, if I'm endeavoring to start a business and I don't have the finances, but I do have the vision, what should I do next? I think there's a couple of ways you could look at. One is you could have someone just front the finances for you. And this is probably more from the financial standpoint. Uh, have someone, have an investor. You, you can talk to people and have investors and explain a vision, explain what you see as an opportunity in the market. And if it makes sense to them, people are willing to put the capital up and, and be able to put those funds in place for you to go out and execute on that vision. And so you'll share in the profits, but you'll still be able to reap the benefits of having that vision uh, and business started. So that's that's one way. And I'll let Kevin give his piece on there. Uh, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Marcellus. I mean, at the end of the day, I've always been a big believer. It doesn't take money to start a business. Right. It, it take it, it, it takes some passion, some motivation and also some planning. <laughs> you know, provision awaits those that are prepared. So even if someone says, I don't have the money, well, you got to start somewhere, right? Business doesn't necessarily have to be the $1 million business you own. I don't care if it's selling shoes out of the back of the trunk of your car or if it's selling toothpicks, you know, on the schoolyard, <laughs> whatever it is, you got to be able to have a track record that say, man, I'm trustworthy. You know, maybe I haven't made millions, but let me show you what I've done over here, man. I've turned this little taco stand, you know, into a $40,000 a year business just on my grit and determination. So you got to own something. It shows the people that are investing in you that you're not just a person with an idea, but you're you're willing to carry it through. So I think you have to just get started at something doesn't take capital. And by the way, when people say I don't have capital, even the poorest people I've met, man, I live in a town of twelve hundred people. And, that, and I, I don't you know, I always joke I live in the redneck Riviera portion of Florida up here in the panhandle. But let me just tell you something, man. Half the people that tell me they ain't got no money, they got, you know, 14 shotguns, three four wheelers. 
You know, they got two boats. You know, I mean, I'm just saying, man, they got nine dogs in the backyard. People got money for whatever they want money for. So even if you don't have $10,000 to start a business, you can accrue money. Maybe it's equity in your home, right? They're, they're, by the way, that's a lesson for some of you, man. Real entrepreneurs, man, that's that risk word again. Put their money where their mouth is. You believe in something, you'll find a way or you'll make a way. You know, I think it's called that whatever it takes mentality. And then I'll just add one thing to what Marcellus was saying. If you've got something that can be profitable, something that makes sense that people believe in, trust me, there's investors that want to put their dollar in small businesses, especially minority-based businesses today. It's a huge investment for a lot of people. But I got to tell you that if you're going to come to me asking for dollars, I need to see a business plan. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they don't have any kind of business plan. They got something scribbled out on a napkin that they wrote up in the Waffle House and they want me to buy into that. I need to know what the business costs. It's not my job to figure out how the how the business is going to you know go from zero dollars to even six figures. I need to at least know that you've done the diligence to figure out how much gas is it going to need. What's the electricity bill going to be? Do you need a warehouse, a shed? You know all the little things it takes to say that hey, maybe you didn't have the money, but you did everything in your power to jumpstart this thing. And on paper, it's a legitimate business. And when you can do that, at least the buy-in from an investor's perspective is much more, you know, uh, is much more doable. Let me get my business plan and send it out right now. So, <laughs> just, uh, but man, I really, really appreciate you guys for pouring into all of these leaders. Look, I know that some of you guys wanted to be a part of the Q&A that's with just Kevin and Marcellus to open up. Um, and I want to open up that platform to you. So look, the first person who messaged me via social media, I'm going to add you to that conversation. I'll send you the private Zoom link to be a part of that conversation. It will not be broadcast to our social media platform. And also, uh, I promised one of you guys through our email blast that uh, someone will receive a free book from uh, Mr. Kevin Mullis, and I'm going to match that book. So Kevin's going to send you a book, and you're not just going to get a book from Kevin, uh, but you're also going to get my book. Uh, a part of that. So you'll get all things are possible. And Kevin, you're going to send your new book or are you going to send, you know, which one of your books you want to give to the people? Can't, can't hear you. you muted. Let me unmute you. <laughs> I got, I'll just have to figure out what the inventory is, but it'll be one of my five books. Look, so uh, I just I, I I saw you some of you guys come in as we saw you interacting and our team did send me a name. Uh, so Miss Ashley Thomas from Picayune, Mississippi, uh, you'll be getting that book. Uh, uh, you can DM me your address uh, and we'll make sure that we get you those copies of those books. We really appreciate all of you uh, for tuning in uh, and thank you for your wealth of wisdom, uh, Kevin and Marcellus, that you have given us and poured into our team and to these business owners and to these ministry leaders. Uh, so thank you. Uh, before we leave, I'm going to allow Kevin to kind of pray us out and cover us uh, with wisdom. So, Yeah, I appreciate it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, that we've gathered together. Lord, this has been a gathering of eagles. Lord, wisdom has been dropped on this platform. Lord, we know that information is the currency of kings. Somewhere in life, Lord, wisdom is the, the ability to discover the difference, the difference in stocks, the difference in real estate, the difference in anointings, the difference in opportunities. And when we can discover those differences, Lord, and you give us the discernment to do so, God, we know that we can walk in perpetual seasons of increase and overflow. Pray that you would bless these people that's taken time, Lord. That's a, that's a seed that they've sown. They've taken time out of their schedule to be on here live I pray, Lord God, that you would commission them in a new way, that you would ignite purpose and passion with clarity and that you would connect them with destiny helpers. People, Lord God, that are looking through the earth for someone to invest in. May you create, Lord, significant relationships, Lord, that are even birthed out of this particular platform. God, we ask you to cover their lives apostolically. We ask you to bless their finances, multiply all that they put their hand to do. And we thank you, Lord, for this and continue to bless Pastor Showers for his Complete commitment, Lord, to upgrading every atmosphere that he enters. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you. Thank you, Marcellus, man. I can't wait to get to Houston next week, man. We'll we'll connect again. Uh, but God bless you guys. Y'all all have a great night. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, I see so many thank yous and 
Kevin, somebody from Bradley said, make sure you know that they love you. So Kevin is Mr. Popular, man. 